Hello, my book hoes. Are you ready for a fun foray into Mr. Malcolm's list? Shockingly, though, not the book, but the movie of the book, which is of a movie. Let's go. Okay, Wilkos, this is an exciting day because your girl, Will Cording, um, got an early preview of Mr. Malcolm's List by Bleecker Street Films. You know that I love Regency stuff, and if you've been watching all of my um, videos and also tons of my own blogs, I mentioned that we're in a Regency of Regency Films. And specifically, we're in a Regency of really exciting things. Like, we are very much still hardening to the idea of, like, awesome stuff and doing tropes of Regency romance, but we're actually doing really cool stuff with it. It's really refreshing and awesome and new, and I'm excited. So this video is going to be in two parts. The first part, I'm going to go over my review, my kind of spoiler-free review of what we're talking about, and then we're going to go into more of like my thoughts and feelings and spoilers ahead. Let's start with an introduction of what Mr. Malcolm's List is. So we first got a short film from Refinery29 years ago, that starred Gemma Chan and Frida Pinto. It actually has like most of the same cast as that short. You've probably seen it. It's really cool. I will link to it in the description. Now after that the um, book came out, Mr. Malcolm's List, and I think there's been a subsequent uh, sequel, both by Susan Allen. And now we have a full-length movie, and you will not see Gemma Chan in this because um, honestly like scheduling that same cast was probably a nightmare and I have like major respect for them getting the amount of people they did from the first one. That being said I don't think you should be disappointed like I think they did amazing casting and there's just a lot to be said. You know what let, let me just get into the review. So to set up the film the story here is a quick introduction just laying the foundation not giving too much away. Julia Thistlewaite is made a public mockery after failing to impress the handsome, eligible, and rich Mr. Malcolm. What is she to do? Well, she invites her childhood friend, Selena Dalton, to come to her place in London. Now, this isn't just a visit. She wants to give Mr. Malcolm a taste of his own medicine. And with the help of a lovely, wonderful cast of characters, we see this plot play out. So, ostensibly, the story is about Selena and Malcolm and this bigger plot to, you know, shame him and make him think about his own life choices. But obviously, which I think it's very apparent in the trailer and if you know the genre of Regency romance and also even Austin herself, clearly there's going to be an actual love plot somewhere in here. The way that it plays out I think will be really fulfilling for most folks out there who enjoy that stuff. So here's my review delivered to you in list form because if we're talking about a movie that the whole basis is on a list what better way to deliver an actual review than a list format. My number one is if you're a Jane Austen fan you will love all of the ways that Jane Austen is intertwined into this movie. There is so much fun poked at not only courting rituals but also society and just the silliness of the different aspects of that world that it is going to be very clear to you that this takes a lot of inspiration from her poking fun at society. Along with that, we're going to have a lot of characters here that you definitely are going to see similarities to various Austin um, heroes and heroines and maybe even some villains. Which brings me to my number two. Mr. Malcolm is actually a refreshing revamp of Mr. Darcy. And I think you're going to fall instantly in love with him. Now I say refreshing revamp because I think we can all agree we've seen a ton of Darcy's, whether in name or people say like it's the enemies to lovers thing. but. There always seems to be a little something missing. I'm so sorry, Hallmark, but like, please stop calling your things like a Lizzie and Darcy if those characters have nothing to do with Pride and Prejudice and you're not going to take any time to write in character development. <laughs> so our Mr. Jeremy Malcolm we see through the eyes initially of just Julia, who has been snubbed by him. So therefore she's going to have a very particular opinion of him. And it's not a good one. It's essentially seeing Darcy from the perspective of Lizzie. And then we shift and we get him from Selena and Lord Cassidy. And we see the kind of idea that like Georgiana would see of Darcy, a much more human, a much more sensitive and compelling person that isn't set out to harm, but just has a lot of care and concern. Number three, the romance is delicious. There is so much to be said about the careful pacing of the romance and all the relationships really in this film, but there are just moments that leave you speechless. 
And I want to refer to my notes for this one because honestly, I think this says it all. This, my note from when I was watching this just tells you just everything about the romance. Quote, sexy croquet scene, sexy croquet scene, Ghost has nothing on this. Number four, the comedy is delightful. What starts off as a story of revenge and anger quickly turns into this really delightful romp with all these characters interacting, whether they want to or not. And I do think part of this is because there's a stunning, the amazing ensemble that works so well together. Selena Dalton, who's played by Frida Pinto, is almost a foil to her childhood friend Julia Thistlewaite, who's played by Zawe Ashton. What I think is brilliant is that their careful relationship, when it, it goes back and forth, it's never really in jeopardy, even during the worst parts. Like, they find a way to maintain a friendship, even though they're going in very different directions of what their wants are. It's playful, and real and it never strays into outright competition. I think Ashton was masterful at timing, whether it was a glance or honestly even the intonation, the raising or lowering of her voice during the performance. I think Julia is a wonderful character because she's uniquely real, even in a world where she could be uniquely comedic. I think we all have met a Julia. <laughs> Number five, the costumes are a feast for the eyes. It's like opening a box of bonbons. Um, everyone has such careful, characterized like palettes and fabrics and designs. And then you see their character progression through the changing and modification of those. People who still expect new Regency things to be as entrenched in historical minutia as Emma 2020, I think you're never gonna have fun again because this film does really cool subtle things but it's nowhere near Emma 2020. Um, but I don't think that should take away from your enjoyment of it. I mean like clearly they had a certain budget and they fit within it and I think they still did beautiful work even within that budget. Number six, there is ample attention to historical detail if that's a kind of thing that you love in your movies. From intensely debating corn laws to references to Billingsgate fishwives, this is jam-packed in its script with historical references, nods, and all those little goodies that self-proclaimed history nerds really love seeing in films. Number seven, I've already started talking about, but the cast. Like, this is a spectacular cast. I cannot say enough about this. Shopee Derisu is perfect as Mr. Malcolm. There's a lot of different um, interviews and featurettes where they talked about, like, how he was the perfect, like, actor for this role. Um, and that was, like, it. That was, like, in-game for them once they, you know, had talked to him and everything. And I think there's a reason because he's amazing. He vacillates between this, like, uptightness of Mr. Malcolm to this, like, really vulnerable Mr. Malcolm because we see him go between these emotions so effortlessly. I think that there's something to be said for also how that contributes to, like, the character and how we see so quickly, you know, Selena being like, I don't think he's quite as proud as you think he is, Julia. I think that early on there's such good um, character development for Malcolm and we can immediately see there's a tenuous relationship between his expectations, like expectations put on him and his heart, like what he wants and needs in his life. I'm also gonna say this is like by far the best work Theo James has done that I've seen um, and I've seen Sandit. <laughs> okay, eight. There are very complicated relationships, but they are all rooted in love. From Julia and Selena's interactions that are now based on this kind of revenge plot, but they've gone back so long, like there's clearly love and understanding and patience there. Um, there's also moments with Selena's parents where they're so kind and so compassionate and understanding and supportive of her. And it's beautiful to see, I think, that what we get really used to in, like, Austin things, I'd say even to a degree, you know, Bridgerton things, is we see parents who are really focused on marriage in these things, because it is a marriage plot. Um, and because of that, there's a distance kind of between feeling for your kid, but I think in this, there's a lot that brings home that these people did care for their ch child, and, like, that there is love um, in these spaces. Number nine. The servants in this movie are the best part of this movie. And I know that I'm probably very biased because I watched this film twice through already. Um, so I could catch more and more each time this, the little asides they'd have. But I think they have the best lines 
um, the best one-offs. I think that something really smart about that is it does take us out of this space of opulence and like class hierarchy um, that's really limited to the upper and like kind of middling class and into the like actual like lower class and being like hey like they're right in the room with you. They can also have thoughts and feelings on the silliness at play. Honestly too I know that it's like partially comedic at times from them but I think that self-awareness is much needed in a lot of period dramas because right now we really do have things that focus on this like upper and middle class and I think you know when I think of Longborn the book and why that was so popular with folks was because it really took a step back and it gave you the Bennets through the perception of the people who had to wait on the Bennets and I think that there's something really important about that that does stray from Austin because she only focused on what she knew as everyone will parrot um but this I think is a wonderful way to take a nod and say there's more people in this room. There's always one more person in this room that we're not giving dialogue to or talking to and giving them even a little I think brings you out of the kind of pure romance of it, the pure fantasy of it, just for a second to be like I know that we're watching a play on a play on a play basically. Like we're, we're, we're watching these layers of Regency romance tropes and all these other things at play but these were real people that we're talking about. This is a real society that did exist and if when we take away the fantasy of it there were real class issues. Number 10. This movie has no room for Nambi Pambas. Seriously though it does a whole lot with so little time. It gives you lots of Austin, it gives you lots of Regency romance tropes, it gives you characters that either you've met in real life or you've seen in other kind of period drama spaces but in a better revamped kind of a hybrid way that isn't too much. It is also a visually stunning film and the script is so concise and smart. I feel like there's energy in silent moments and even in the most tense frenzied ones there are still moments of reservation. So that was the um, kind of review section. I am going to now delve into more um, intense notes and like moments of it that I wanted to talk about. Um, so there's gonna be spoilers ahead. So for folks wanting a time frame for this we start with a quick scene in 1802 of Julia and Selena as kids and then we bump to 1818. So 1818 is when this is really starting to like take place. So we fast forward basically to Julia getting ready for an outing and it's the opera. She's going with Mr. Malcolm and this is where everything starts to go to for everybody. So we have a narrator who does give us information on Mr. Malcolm. We'll later meet the narrator I, but I love that we have started this standard of Regency things need a narrator because I think especially for Austin considering how internal her books are it's really nice to have the ability to kind of explain stuff as it's happening um, because you can't always have that in script. And clearly from the reaction people had to Netflix's persuasion of breaking the fourth wall. Some people don't like other you know options of conveying information. I do like that like they had while he was walking up you know you could hear people talking about him. Um, you could specifically hear um, 20,000 a year and I loved that little nod because if you're an Austin fan that immediately gets you into oh this is a very well-off person. This is this is where we are. This is one of the reasons he's gonna be very attractive to people. I love Selena's setup. We see her in the countryside. It's very pastoral. Um, it looks very you know 2005 Pride and Prejudice like long born very well loved. There's this there's an early proposal scene that is a 9.5 on the Mr. Collins cringe scale but I think the way they did it was really fun um, and silly but also just like oh the cringe like the the silliness I think took a level off the cringe so that you could bear the whole scene. <laughs> After Julia and Malcolm go to the, the opera there's a caricature of her um, because she clearly did not impress him and now she's made a mockery because everyone's seeing that even Selena sees this caricature of this terrible outing. So Julia recruits her cousin Cassidy, Lord Cassidy, aka Cassie, to join her uh, adventure. <laughs> Lord Cassidy is actually friends with Malcolm and gets, you know, gets to talk to him about this and says, you know, you're, you're having a reputation now. You're acquiring different names like Dream Destroyer. I do think this really quick turnaround that we get to see of Malcolm versus we don't get to really see this from Darcy in Pride and Prejudice is that while he's talking to his friend Lord Cassidy we get to actually hear his reasoning for everything. So it's not just the one-sided oh he's a snob it's 
I have these reasons because I have a lot of expectations on me. And so he shows his friend his list, his list of um, traits that he would like to have in a partner. So again, this is like really where the plot goes in because Julia is just like, there's a list. She's more offended than ever. And she's like, I'm inviting my friend who I never remember to write back to and I never invite to London. Um, I'm inviting Selena to come stay with me in London because I am going to get revenge on this Mr. Malcolm for his snub. Selena is more than happy to come. She was at home after um, living in Bath for a long time. She was the companion of this old woman who died very recently. And so having this excuse to go to London uh, was nice for her. Of course, she doesn't know until she gets there that she is actually there to help Julia launch a revenge plot. <laughs> we get a delightful makeover scene. Like there are so many parts of this that like just hearken to other like Austin things. Like it, it, it feels almost clueless in level of just like makeover, you know, oh, we're gonna get your dress made for you and all this stuff. And then we get into the first kind of Julie trying to push, you know, Selena into the limelight. And so Julia has certain ideas of like, what's gonna work to like get Mr. Malcolm. And so she's just like, we'll make you the incognita of the season. Um, so she like makes Selena not be at the main ball um, for her first ball. She makes her go hide in the orangery. You've probably seen photos and clips of that scene in the trailers and in the promo. It is divine. It is, again, it's one of those moments of silence with tension, with like energy. Their conversation, Mr. Malcolm and Selena's first conversation is just divine. It's, it's strewn with historical and literary references, but it's also so very vivid when it comes to how they both are playing with each other and playing off of each other in a way that shows like not only fun and attraction but like mental like I guess you're on the same page like equals if you will. If you have been looking for uh, more Pride and Prejudice 1995 smoldering looks across the room kind of stuff, this has got it. This has got some tense looks across the room, um, smoldery eyes at each other. We meet Henry Ossery. He runs into Selena and Malcolm later on in the film and Theo James is Mr. Henry Ossery and he is back from the war and he's in London and he um, actually was trying to see Selena because she was the companion to his aunt. Um, there's a fun funness there because he actually knows Malcolm and they don't stray into like a full competition thing like they're clearly like friends um and so they're just kind of just like in a happy i guess competition but not full like angry at each other thing and there's some love for mr ossery somewhere in this movie i do want to note too that like one of the fun like elements that they have in here the editing is that they have a, a list and you'll see someone marking off the things so as selena is in, you know, interacting with Mr. Malcolm and doing the things that he does have on this list as good qualities. You see a hand checking it off slowly. After Selena's first date with Mr. Malcolm, and like obviously date is in quotations, um, there is a wonderful kitchen recap scene with Julia that's just so spot on. And like a servant was there originally and like, um, she kind of gets like shooed away, but like this is really a conversation about like Selena and Julia recapping this date um and it just felt so real like Julia runs and gets like a big dessert out of the, the like kitchen and it's just like spooning like this massive flummery into her mouth which is amazing um and like I love and can relate to always being like let's like have snacks as we talk about something but it just felt so like modern and beautiful and real to be like let's recap your first your first day let's go over all the details and also i'm gonna like like get some snacks out let's go to the kitchen let's hang out again there's so many little historical things in here um we have mr malcolm at the beginning trying to talk about corn laws with julia which i'm gonna make a whole video about all the historical references in here that i can because there's a ton and then later on he asks um selena about a church bill and you can actually look all these things up and they are in the world and real and actual things so at this this dinner with like Malcolm like kind of like throwing little like curveballs at Selena just to, like get an idea of like her thoughts on things and like if she is you know paying attention to current events and such um and if they are on the same side of certain political things clearly um this is one of my favorite things like there's so many servants lines in here that are spot on 
but like they're debating like church bill and like money and all this stuff and one of the servants is just like they could just pay us better and I'm just like <laughs> every time I saw that scene I just like laughed so hard because it was so real and so good and again it's one of those ones that like takes you out of the comedy of it and into the like there's a reality here where they, like we were romping in a fantasy world but there's the real stark reality that like there are people here that are serving you that are paid to like bring food to your table and clean your clothes and do this and there is a class that we are missing in this conversation um i've already mentioned the croquet scene but i just I don't want to spoil things but like croquet scene is like divine there's comedy elements to it there's sensual elements to it it's nice it's nice like it's obviously I know that we've just had like a sexy croquet scene from Bridgerton but like I think for folks who really prefer the kind of fade to black romance stuff um where you know you don't get any sex at all um I think this is this is gonna be a fave for you. The tension that Henry, Ossery, and Julia Thistlewaite um, start to develop is divine. Like I love, it's kind of just like almost like goading each other and then it's just like, mm, like they keep on until it's like, it's just juicy, it's juicy. We meet Mrs. Covington, who's like a distant relation of Selena's um, and very silly, very over the top and um, fun things happen there. She might annoy some viewers, but I think she's a necessary kind of like addition to the party to be like, no, 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 Julia isn't the extreme. Mrs. Covington is the extreme of characters in this movie. I loved seeing Mr. Malcolm at home. It's very, again, similar to Darcy at home where there's a different comfort. The difference here is that instead of siblings, what we see him with is his mom. And I think having his mother there where you can see that she's concerned about him and her concern is really rooted somewhere else because she doesn't really know these people. She doesn't really know Julia and Selena and all this. But I think having that um, care there on screen and that dynamic and her being like trying to unpack what is up with her son is really good. There is a masquerade ball and it is adorable and it's perfect and I just like I'm all for having more masquerade things in Regency stuff because it was a thing. We know that like those were wonderful devices obviously too for romance, for potential like courting, for potential social slip-ups. More masquerades always forever. At one point Lord Cassidy boops Julia on the nose and it was like Again, there's so many things that are so modern in this, but that are just perfectly done, not like overdone. Um, I think it was just perfectly just like paced and balanced. Selena's entrance to the masquerade is so good. And then like Mr. Malcolm goes up and he's like, may I a mere mortal and, like to ask her to dance. And I'm just like, I melted, like it's melting. Then there's chaos at the ball, the truth comes out. There's a lot of, um, you know, plot basically that goes down suddenly an explanation there's like big romantic gesture at the end I don't want to give too much away because I do want people to like enjoy it and I know I warned about spoilers but like the kind of scenes where Malcolm is coming to Selena and they're both without you know the complications of all these other things and they're they're raw real selves it's beautiful I think it's a beautiful location I think the way they did it is beautiful I think the way they brought back the list at the end was perfect um and it was just it's so good like it just oh it was just like swoony um I will also say stay for the credits if you can because they um incorporate more of the kind of caricature stuff um to kind of give you an idea of what happens next with these characters after the movie's over some costume detail I want to talk about Selena is dressed in like these more like organic, less fancy things, but there's beautiful texture to them. Her clothes are obviously, you know, based on budget and everything. She's not as high class as Julia, but there's something we said for like they're free flowing and much more natural in their f how they look and feel. And she's brought into Julia's scheme, her clothes from the colors to the fabric start to look more like Julia's. I think there's a couple scenes though where Julia literally hands her her own things. So I think it's it's again kind of this moment of like Emma where we have Harriet kind of being brought in and all that. But instead of Harriet being kind of really, really beholden to Emma and just going along, Selena is a very different character. And also no matter how fancy Selena's clothes get, she just shrugs off things. Like once her dress tears once and she's just like whatever about it. Like these aren't, for her to be over concerned about she's still 
at her core Selena, even when she's in Julia's kind of clothing. And then at the end of the movie, of course, we get the return to her more natural, organic clothing. Less structured, less tailored, especially compared to her childhood friend, Julia. As far as color choices, I feel like Selena's was much more grassy and natural, um, more organic versus Julia, where it was much more floral, I'll say. Like, much more, like, obviously, like, dyes and everything matter. You know, she would have the money to get more expensive dyes but and fabrics, but I feel like that's kind of the the balance and then we see obviously a little bit of Julia's color palette seeping into Selena as the story moves on as Julia gets her fitted for clothes. It's also the same for the hair. There's a hair story there too of like Julia has the more complicated hairdos and bonnets and all that while Selena has simpler ones except for you know when she's going to a ball or something and Julia clearly gets her made up. Julia has just a stunning array of garments. Um, I love the, the matching through ways with her too. Obviously again I've said it's more tailored, it's more fitted, um, less kind of relying on gathering and more of a it is fitted to her body. She'd had the money obviously to have it made for her and not just made adjustable for future use. She also has um, heavier fabrics, much more trim. <laughs> Her bonnets are super fanciful. Like Selena's main bonnet that she wears is kind of something that I feel like I found at Target, um, which isn't like a bad thing. Like Target never is used derogatorily in this house. Um, versus Julia, who like hers were clearly like they're, they're a Regency bonnet. They're very done up. Mr. Malcolm's clothing also has a richness to it that's just like perfect because it's not like too showy but it's still very clear that like things are tailored to this man and they're made of very fine materials, but not just like over the top. There is an ease and a richness, but there's also very much a practicality to him, which is his character, right? <laughs> like he has money, but he's not leaning toward these louder things that bring attention to him like Lord Cassidy does. He also has a palette that's much like Selena's, so seeing them have a romance makes sense because we already signaled that they have these kind of earthier, richer tones. I called that palette pastoral and green, um, but rich in its lush notes of the land and environment. Which makes sense because I feel like once we go to Malcolm's home in the country, he does feel so much more comfortable. Cassie also plays with color. Uh, the costumes for Lord Cassidy are amazing. There's almost like a Lord Byron moment at the croquet scene, I swear, because he's just like drenched in fur and luxury. He has so much print on him and so many color combos and so many print combos. It's great. I think that like if you are looking for the kind of louder Regency look, he's got that nailed. <laughs> like we've got salmon colored cravats, we've got like brocade stuff, we've got just all of it. It's all over. Anyway, all that to say, I think this movie was outstanding. I think that everyone should please go check it out if you can. And hopefully it'll be on streaming soon. I know it's going to theaters July 1st. And I know going to the theater may not feel safe and comfortable for folks. So I'm really hoping that it will be on streaming and I can um, share links to that when I have them. And honestly, I think because we see that he does go between those things so effort effortless. Because we see him go between these feelings so effortless.